All right. Thank you all for coming, calling the meeting to order. Uh, we start with public audience. If there's anybody who would like to address the board, uh, please state your name, your address, and you have three minutes for public comment. Just step up to one of the microphones. <laughs> I, you can pull that there down you towards the right center. <laughs> you just pull that down. There you go. Uh, hi, my name is Lori Boyko, and I live at 15 Oakhurst Road in Simpson. And I actually um, have some questions. So I'll just read them all. Um, with regard to all of the students having to wear masks in all of the schools in Simsbury. I would like to know with whom does the final decision about that requirement rest? Is it the governor, the state board of ed, the state health department, the Farmington health department, the town board of selectmen, or this board or the superintendent alone? Um, is the decision subjective or is there an objective set of criteria for making the decision? If so, what are those benchmarks and thresholds on which that decision is being made? And lastly, does the town receive any financial incentives directly or indirectly for following specific COVID protocols? And if so, what are they? I can give it a shot. You want to? Sure. I'll, let you. Um, I'll start with the last one first. Certainly not the Board of Ed, none that I know of on the town side in terms of financial incentives. Um, we do have grant funding that, that's come in, uh, federal grant funding, but not tied to anything we need to produce relative to COVID data or COVID cases or COVID protocol. Um, there's a grant application where we have to kind of denote um, our focus for the grant funding, say it's for tutoring services and, and kind of the amount and if there's any staff. Um, but no reward based on information that we give out. Um, in terms of objective criteria, um, a real kind of set of criteria that says, hey, they're on or they're off. Uh, I have not seen that set criteria provided um, by the State Department of Public Health uh, at this point. Um, I, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that we're starting to have conversations at a local level with the Farmington Health uh, District. Uh, and I know that um, they're also in conversation with the Board of Selectmen who has a, a localized town mask mandate on what those potential, you know, what tools are out there and how can we, sorry, I keep fogging up. How can we um, set some criteria to make decisions, not just on the mask, but, you know, other mitigation practices as well. Uh, I haven't seen it, but from what I've uh, been told thus far, um, I don't know the right name of it, so I apologize. You remember the, the chart that goes with, it, it's like you're in the gray, you're in the yellow, you're in the, you're in the red, right? So I think it's looking at some of those criteria, looking at trends, uh, considering positivity rate and those things. So I think before too long, we will be talking about those things, but I haven't seen uh, a set kind of on off criteria established yet. Uh, in terms of who's the final decision maker, I think it depends on what's going on at the time, to be honest with you. I know the executive powers were extended today, so that final say sits with the governor at this point. Uh, and if it changes, it's gonna depend on how he decides to come out of that and when, whether it becomes a local control situation, State Department of Health situation. But right now that sits with the governor. As far we as don't have any control. No. Not to override an executive order, no. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there anybody else who wishes to address? All right, then we will move on to uh, committee reports and communications. Yep. Oh, sorry. Yes, Jen, you have an email that came in? Yes. Could you yes, please read yeah. that into? Yes. Okay. Um, the email came in from Amy Allen and says, my ultimate question, why are there not choices with how our children learn within this school system. Um, and then open parentheses, just turn computers on, close parentheses. Why can't those that flourished last year virtually continue to learn on the same platform? 
Are we continuing to hold our teachers accountable to previous standing best practices in posting assignments? Who makes ultimate decisions regarding flexibility for those that fall outside of the one size fits all model? Open parentheses, I am well aware of state and other guidance and recommendations. This does not prohibit Simsbury from accommodating all students with all learning styles. Thanks, Amy Allen. Okay. Um, so now we will move on to committee reports and board of ed communications. So Olivia, our student rep, you're up first. All right, so um, I thought I'd start with Central School. Um, Ms. Hen Ms. Hennessy reported that Central had a wonderful turnout at the back to school picnic last week. Many families came out to get reconnected with each other and the PTO hosted a terrific event. Um, at Tootman Hills, Ms. Belmonte reported that Tootman Hills hosted their annual curriculum night on Wednesday, September 23rd. And it was a wonderful to see their families come together and meet one another and learn all about the wonderful school year ahead. Um, Latimer Lane and Squadron, both hosted their open house curriculum nights as well. It had been two years since Latimer hosted the last one, so it was nice to welcome everyone back. Latimer is also looking forward to their welcome back picnic on October 5th. Um, Squadron was looking, was happy to host the families of kindergarten and grades one and two two weeks ago. They're looking forward to hosting a curriculum night for grades three to six tomorrow night. Um, at Terrafield, Terrafield has been highlighting Hispanic Heritage Month from September 15th to October 15th. And this includes morning announcements, read aloud books, and other fun activities. Um, at Henry James, Mrs. Rosenberg <coughs> said that a wide variety of clubs are starting up at Henry James with interest and attendance has been very high so far. A couple of new clubs this year that haven't been there before include Beatboxing Club and Sign Language Club. Um, they have finally been able to use the new auditorium where they have been holding team meetings. And each student and staff has received a yellow blue and blue bracelet with the words at HJMS hashtag TPWK, which is treat people with kindness. And at Simsbury High, um, we are looking forward to Spirit Week and Homecoming at the end of this week. And Mr. Petrine is here tonight with the presentation, so I'll let him report on the high school. Great, thank you. Uh, Sharon, do you have anything? Yes, I do. So um, a couple of things. One, um, outside of the community, um, today I participated in um, interviewing candidates for CAVES. Um, upcoming elections that are going to be going towards Delphi for the Delphi uh, Assembly. Um, internally, I guess one of the things I wanted to bring up is I understand it's been addressed, but um, I'm sure most of us are aware of the discussion that happened over the weekend regarding the homecoming um, mm -hmm. this weekend. The homecoming just, dance. The homecoming dance, and I understand it's been resolved, but um, i just like us to just be a little bit more mindful. I think in some ways we can sometimes over communicate rather than under communicate. And I think that's one situation where I think we could have communicated a little bit better. And I and to that point, I would also ask that our families contact the schools instead of using Facebook, because right. that is a really good way to get the right answers. Yes, yeah, and that, and I said that to a number. Of them. Yes, but I think the just since we're having a conversation, I think. Outside of Facebook, I think people didn't understand. There was no communication. And I think well, how we resolved it by opening it up today, if we had just said to them, we're taking just a pulse and we'll open it up Monday, I think the same thing could have happened. Right. And I, I did see that communicated over the weekend via the um, president yeah. of yeah. the yeah. Uh, like the PTC. Yeah. Yeah. I did see that. Um, and Mr. Petrina did Steve reach out very yeah. quickly. Yeah. So I just, again, would ask our parents to take a beat before going to Facebook and let our schools respond first. But that's just a request for me. <laughs> Tara, do you have anything? Um, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Jen? I'm good. Jeff? No, nothing. Thanks. Lid? Yeah, just, um, just briefly, we, um, we had a prep, um, council meeting last week. It was the first meeting of the uh, of the year. We did have it in person, our first meeting at, at Crack Central. And uh, so we welcomed back 8,000 plus students back to the Crack, uh, crack School System. And uh, so the, um, you know, the threat to enrollment this year is obviously COVID, which has been, has been the, the continuing, the continuing um, area that 
all districts are grappling with, not only in, in CREP. Um, so with that uh, moving forward, programs are in full force, um, starting in full force. And another interesting area, the Head Start program, we in CREP now are um, exploring other options, or we have explored and we are opening up other Head Start facilities within the CREP system. So we will be the largest provider of the Head Start programs. We took it over two years ago from another state agency. So there's going to be um, a lot of good news coming from that, serving our, our students in, in the greater Hartford area and beyond that. Also in CREC, we have the, the second year of the teacher residency program. So we have 28 um, teachers in that program, teachers of color that are going through the ranks of the CREC program that hopefully will be employed within the CREC system and outside districts. Many districts um, have also expressed interest in, in the teachers once they complete the residency program, you know, to uh, possibly you know, be hires in, in, in their community. So we also have, um, and this is interesting, the DEI group. We have a user group now. and um, also Can you tell Dallas, us what DEI is just for people listening? Like? Yes, I'm sorry. That, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. And we now have um, a, a user group. And uh, they will be contacting many coordinators around the state as our own here. And uh, Elsie Gonzalez and Amy Caron will be will be leading this um, this this um, user group. So it's important that we, we keep on top of that along with other districts to, to make this very functional for all our districts. And again, as always, we talked about the bus driver or the bus driver shortage or transportation shortage. That is going around not only the, the us, the state, and the country, right. and um, many of the districts around the table representing their own districts in CREC um, have also had concerns about that. So that is an oncoming um, area that we've talked about. We also have on the, in the on the CREC council um, we have Don Harris, who's chair of the Bluefield Board of Ed, and he sits on the state board of education, and uh, he and another came and spoke about. Um, you know, the in support to the Board of Education members and superintendents. A letter had gone um, had gone out to superintendents just you know explaining their thanks to all of the districts around the states, the work they've done within the past year or two of, of COVID. So I just briefly want to tell you a little bit about NSBA. Uh, I attended last week a conference in Atlanta for the Council of Urban Boards of Education. And as I mentioned before, this is an opportunity for all large and small urbans around the country to, to gather together. We were there um, for, for with protocols in place for COVID, so everyone had obliged and, and, and was there. But um, it's a great opportunity for board members around the country to interact, talk about what's going on, not only within their districts, um, but also around their states and, and share, share a lot of information. But on the other part of that is, is I'm chair of the um, NASBAC, National School Boards Action Center. And then we are the grassroots campaign organization to NSBA. So we are in Washington, well, we were a lot before COVID, but we'll be going again, hopefully in the um, end of uh, January when the legislature starts and the Congress um, convenes. But just some interesting stats, the campaigns, the grassroots campaigns have enlisted more than 5,100 school board advocates throughout America. And I would like to have um, have all of you participate in this. It's just easy text that once you get from an SBA, all you have to do is answer to you know to con contact your um, legislator. And we initiated more than fifteen thousand direct interactions with Congress, and this was all in really of twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty one. So the grassroots campaigns are important because they generate the social media advocacy actions, and these are about all the things that we do advocate, advocate not on a local level, but on a state level and a national level to, to our um, congressional delegations. So we are going to continue with this again now that fall is here and um, and everyone is back in, in D.C. and uh, hopefully we'll be able to um, you know have you participate in, in some of these really important questions that, you know, actions. Great. And that's our report. Thank you, ma'am. Mrs. Lemke. Nothing right now. Okay, Mr. Solomon. Yeah, just to give you a quick update on a um, story that I'm sure you've all seen in the news, which is the vaccine mandate for K-12 schools. Um, I reported to the board two weeks ago that for us, that is right around a thousand people from uh, all employment groups in the district. Um, and uh, the September 27th yesterday was the the date that the, the mandate um, 
uh, went into place um, and the first weekly test, if people are choosing not to be vaccinated, will be due Friday to um, Human Resources Office. Um, but I am pleased to report that um, it's just 3% of folks across our employment groups who are choosing the weekly testing. So incredibly high vaccination rate, which is great. And we're working with the other folks through um, the uh, exemption avenues and the other ways um, that they can opt out of the, uh, of the vaccination requirement, but submit themselves to weekly testing. So we're getting that done. It's been a lot of work um, and we'll see how it goes after this weekend for the first week. All right, terrific. Jason, you have anything for us? No. All right, Mr. Perth. No, just that I'm excited to be at the high school. I can't believe we're almost at October 1st and um, get the annual presentation tonight from the high school team. And we have some new members here. So that'll be great to get them out in front of the board a little bit. Yep. Um, a little bit of a state of the state of, of COVID. I've been, you know, you know, as you know, monitor the information and the data and pretty encouraged at the last kind of six reporting days at the state level that the positivity rate continues to, to go down. Um, so I think there's uh, starting to be a pretty widespread feeling that that has plateaued and we'll start to see uh, a downward trend, which is really good. Um, we had a, a more challenging week in Simsbury this past week in terms of, of cases as a community. Uh, but the reality is of that in Farmington Valley, we're usually late to start a surge when it occurs and then we're a week or two behind it. So I would imagine that uh, we'll be in good shape with that trend as well in the, in the next couple of weeks. So um, it, it obviously, as, as Neil said, with the policy, policies and procedures and the mandates uh, continues to be a big part of um, what our administrative team has to has to wrestle with. Um, and, and we're working through that um, as well as trying to uh, make sure we have enough time to focus on the teaching and learning work, which is the most important. And that's what we're going to hear from uh, tonight from both Sue's team and, and Steve's team. So that's all I have. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, we're going to move on to recommended actions. So I need a motion for the approval of the minutes of the September 14th meeting. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Um, I need acceptance of the completion of the Henry James Project Phase 1 and Squadron, Squadron Line School Office Project. Jason, why don't you tee that up a little bit? Sure. So the administration is asking the board for acceptance of the squadron line main office and Henry James phase one project. Uh, these are both projects that have been completed for a few years. The reason for doing this now is to file the appropriate uh, paperwork for the state construction permits. Can you remind us of what phase one was at Henry yeah. James? Because <laughs> I feel like it's been a while. Yes. Uh, phase one started out as mostly fire suppression expansion uh, and lockers. So, oh, so this was pre-library, pre-auditorium, pre This was the, the first kind of cleanup of Henry James and the squadron and the reoffice squadron. org was quite a few years ago as well. So Jason, right. we had talked earlier today both projects are roughly, we're roughly about a million dollars and you estimate that the eligible cost potentially back after filing is a couple hundred thousand, 300,000? Yeah, so okay. you know, those dollars go back to town. So certainly they important that we close, yep, we yep. close that out. Okay, so can I please get the motion on the projects? Sure, I'll move that the Simsbury Board of Education accepts as complete the Squadron Line School Main Office Project, that is 128-0105A, and the Henry James Phase 1 Project, 128-0106A slash CB, and authorizes the acceptance of the school building grants. There's a second, please. I will second. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. So now I'm going to ask the board, in interest of viewing the presentations, if we all can move to the front row so we can see the screen behind us, and our presenters are going to kind of come up and face us. So if you want to take your notebook so you can make notes. Um, but 
that makes that easier. Oops. Sorry, y'all. Making noise. <laughs> That's me. Like a gazelle. Where do you want to go, Georgia? Here, Ooh, come here. You can click. Move that one. Yeah. You're gonna click. I know you wanted the big chair, but the, the big chair is dangerous. <laughs> okay. So this is exciting. As Mr. Patri uh, Mr. Curtis just shared, we have members of the Simsbury High School team with us tonight to provide a very comprehensive report. So Mr. Steve Petrina, principal, assistant principals, Georgia Robert and Vanessa Messiah are both here, as well as our director of school counseling, Greg Stillman. And they're going to share with you many celebrations of this high school community. They will also share with you some student performance results that exemplify the tradition of excellence that we've been accustomed to here at Simsbury High School. Share with some goals, with you some goals from the strategic plan, certainly aligned, but is really specific to their work here at the high school. So with that, Principal Petrina. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I, if, if you didn't hear my graduation speech, I, 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 I always start with my one-liner now, which is uh, uh, you guys appointed me on March 11th, 2020. So uh, I appreciate the two and a half years of, uh, of COVID that uh, we've had. So, uh, uh, but uh, we did have that great one day of March 12th. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm thrilled to be here and um, we're thrilled to have you here. And uh, I'm especially thrilled to have, uh, we have a couple of my rookies here and uh, I, we promise that you'll treat them nicely and I, I'm sure you will. Um, I'm going to start, it's sort of twofold. I want to start last year a little bit and walk you through the summer and then we'll talk you through what's going on this year. Greg will give you a little data and uh, Vanessa will take you through from there. Last year was a year like none other. Plain and simply, uh, we asked teachers and families and students to do things that no one had ever done before and do it on the fly. Um, I think a lot of us that are sitting in this room remember huddling around George's office trying to see what its class looks like online. That's where we started the year. And to get to a point where we could get to a finish line and get to a point where uh, the online learning could be of uh, value and of high quality, uh, uh, was really uh, an amazing capability of of learning on the fly uh, and 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 a, and teamwork and everything else that went into that. So just uh, uh, just so unbelievably proud of that effort uh, and and the day to day grind to make that right. All everybody, technology, everyone involved, uh, trying to get that uh, to the best uh, that we could. So with all that. Um, and all the hardships and the stops and starts that went with that, um, we, we achieved amazing accomplishments in, in 2020 and 2021. And this is a long list, and I just want to highlight just a couple of them uh, that, uh, that, that really stand out to me. Uh, first and foremost is the, uh, is the second one down, Equity Week. Uh, it was just an amazing accomplishment to see the community come together and this community pull that together for both online students and students in the school to go for one week over 40 different presentations uh, and uh, uh, to see the, uh, again, the passion, the learning that took place was really uh, outstanding. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, where's Jen? I'll 
pointed out that we had a great new uh, tradition uh, started uh, with Hispanic scholars being uh, awarded by the college board, uh, which was really an, uh, a unique, neat thing to, to recognize in this town. And uh, if we go down the line a little bit further, uh, our sports programs. And two really stand out. Uh, the Michaels Cup, for those of you that don't know, uh, is based on participation and uh, the, the other teams kind of scoring schools as to how they feel about that playing those schools. And uh, we were able to win the Michaels Cup again uh, last year. And on top of that, our unified sports program was named the unified sports program of the year, an amazing achievement of which we're actually uh, getting ready to uh, potentially or build a team uh, that will be heading down to Disney World uh, at the end of the year to participate in the basketball, uh, uh, national basketball tournament. So a great honor and great thrill. And I think we closed it out with really uh, what I thought was really just everything about COVID, everything that uh, is about our school is that we produced a play. And to, to actually, again, I, I'm just so blown away. Uh, the idea was we're going to have a hard time filling. We can't fill this auditorium. We can't put on a play as usual. We're going to write one. And the kids worked month after month to put together these scripts. And then we even got to the end. We said, oh, we should film it. We should run it. And to pull that all off uh, was clearly amazing. So what just happened uh, is really really, um, I think a great title that sums up uh, really what just happened. I can't believe uh, that a, a group of 17 and 18 year olds was able to uh, achieve that accomplishment with the great support of uh, uh, the staff members. So we were thrilled coming out. We had a great graduation and uh, we switched to our summer. And after a, a grateful couple of weeks of downtime, uh, our ending early and uh, gave us a little bit, uh, we set right out on uh, moving ahead uh, for this year. And and uh, the summer of 2021, again, was something, uh, again, like we've never seen before. Uh, we had recovery and enrichment programs. I want to give you the numbers, all right? We, we, we had 45 credit earned classes uh, this summer to make up for those kids who didn't quite or fell behind. And we had 60 kids take enrichment classes uh, this summer uh, to get prepared and ready to go. So when we hit the ground running, we could really move forward and not leave anybody behind. Um, I give a ton of credit to Matt Milch, who is our uh, department chair of math, who took the leadership of these programs. And it was just a really impressive sight to come in throughout the month of July and August to see students coming in, learning, improving. And uh, again, these are obviously the students that had struggled to get us uh, to get to that finish line at the end of the year. On top of all that fun, we've been uh, uh, enjoying our roof project, as you can imagine, never is a, a, a thing get so little gain. You're like, you can't see it, you can't believe in it, and yet the disruption that uh, building a roof uh, is, is and the necessity of it is uh, really something. Um, on top of that, we got our air conditioning in the third floor in a, in a good chunk of rooms. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, it is uh, 48 years overdue, um, and uh, hopefully we can finish it up up there. And we've had some lovely volunteer work uh, uh, in our courtyard to get that up to steam. Uh, I, I wish the weather was a little better today and we could have walked through it, uh, but uh, it's a beautiful space and uh, we just reclaimed it from the roofing company uh, and uh, we were ready to showcase it for you. Uh, uh, but uh, again, if you have time, we'll, we'll get out there uh, when the weather cooperates. The final thing that we did this summer was uh, adopt the, the eight drop two schedule. And I know it comes with this yin and yang. No schedule is perfect. I will start with that. And I understand the confusion and the anxiety, especially among parents, um, that this caused and, and, and students. I understand that. So again, the positives of that schedule, we're going to talk a little bit more about it. But uh, the idea of an hour long class seems to have caught on as the right amount of time. That was one of the big goals. Uh, the rotation has uh, really greatly aided us this year uh, with our driving in situation being backed up. We would have in the past would have had first period teachers screaming on my door, but now that it rotates to one, two, and three, and four, there's a shared uh, uh, agony uh, to that, uh, and uh, it, it has worked. But um, 
the complaints that I've heard, and, and we will continue to listen and continue to evaluate, have really been about um, not so much the schedule itself, but the, the getting comfortableness of it. So we don't have anyone walking around the halls lost uh, and not knowing what periods, but we do have kids going, geez, I need to make a guidance appointment on Friday. I can't quite, that takes two or three layers of figuring out where I am, what day is that gonna be, what's the schedule that day, where's my free period, and then I gotta get to Mr. Stillman or whoever, and. Uh, that does take a bit. So we haven't got comfortable with that yet, I understand. Uh, but again, I think the basis of it uh, has moved uh, in a pretty good direction uh, so far. But we are open, we're looking, we're, we're, we're obviously uh, aware that this was a, a significant change uh, to the culture here uh, of the school. All right, so I'm gonna turn you over to, uh, to one of our main rookies here, uh, Mr. Stillman. We're thrilled to have him. Greg, uh, I, we, we've had Greg for how many years? 20, 20 years and uh, has made uh, the jump to uh, to, to dare to, to replace uh, Joan Ramsey slash Jane Allen Peregrine uh, to stalwarts of the community. But uh, we are thrilled to have Greg's voice. We are thrilled to have his leadership. And I'm gonna turn it over to him to share some of the academic reports uh, for you. So Greg, I'll turn it over to you. All right, good evening, everybody. As Mr. Petrina said, we're very proud with the efforts of our students uh, in the face of all the adversity we faced over the last couple of years. Um, in March, all of our juniors sat for the SAT in what we call the school day SAT, uh, and the scores are up on the screen above. Although there was a slight dip in the scores from previous years, our scores are still amongst the highest in the DERG. We've continued to partner with a program called College Planning Partnership, which offers students the ability to take an SAT prep class at a reduced rate uh, in hopes that we can continue to, to provide support to students as they plan for the SATs going forward. We have continued to encourage our students to challenge themselves in their high school career, and you can see that 76% of seniors completed at least one AP course before graduation. This number is up from the 70% that it was the year before. The next bullet down shows that 72% of students scored a three or higher on the AP exam. And this is a great number, although it is a little bit down from previous years. Uh, and I think that can be attributed to the fact that last year, unlike in 2020, College Board didn't slow down their expectations or the pace that they expected you to learn at. Um, so we were basically operating out of a hybrid schedule, block schedule, and students were not getting the amount of time in the class to gain all the content that was needed for the AP exam. So our expectation is that that score will go up, that percentage will go up next year, um, but it's something that we'll keep an eye on. Even with all the challenges, uh, we've still seen a great success in our acceptance to college admission. Um, we have 80% of our students attending four-year college from last year, 7% attending two-year college. Um, it's, a, it's a goal of our school counselors every year to make sure every student has a plan uh, of where they're gonna go after graduation. So whether it's attending college uh, or going to a technical school or taking a gap year, we wanna make sure every student has a plan uh, and that's a goal of ours. Um, you'll see that we had a uh, high percentage of students that were accepted to tier one colleges. That's been pretty consistent uh, over, over the course of my 20 years here, um, and last year was no different. Um, and then even the as we track students' success in college, you can see we've been pretty steady as we track how many students uh, fulfill their graduation within six years of attending college. Uh, that number has maintained uh, a pretty high number over the over the last few years. All right, Great. thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. Um, I, I want to now move, so, so that's some of last year's numbers and we'll be glad to take some questions at the end on that. Uh, and I want to move a, a bit to this year and, and, and what's gone on. And uh, I want to give everyone here credit uh, for this. I, I've been around a long, long time and I've gone through a lot of different plans and structures. And those of you that know me, I'm not always a big fan of uh, uh, things that come from the board on down, but I will tell you this, um, your goals that you aligned uh, for us, uh, 
in terms of our, our four areas, which you'll see in a couple of seconds, on top of uh, the vision of the graduate attributes that we've uh, collected, have enabled us uh, to build what we called our one-pagers. So I'll ask George to turn the one. Our one-pager is, uh, it, it looks complicated, and you can see your sort of goals around the outside and what we're trying to do. This is the one pager that I put together and it, it looks busy and it looks complicated. We're gonna simplify it a little bit, but please know this is the document that everybody works off of. And so it is comprehensive, but many of these are student driven or many of these are for our department chairs or for administration uh, to look at. But it enables us in one place and in one opportunity uh, to align on down, uh, which you'll hear a lot about alignment coming up in, in Sue's presentation uh, to uh, your goals and the town goals and, and our vision of the graduates. So uh, we're really thrilled uh, about this layout. Uh, again, we have just about everybody look into this and, and use it and see where it matches up in terms of putting their PGP goals to teachers. Uh, it has uh, really uh, 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 become a, a staple of our existence and, and a way to redefine us and keep us clear and, and steady. So uh, we... We're, we're going to we're going to break it down a little bit, all right. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to turn this over to another, uh, not a rookie, but close. There's her first presentation is Vanessa, and she'll break down each of the quadrants a little bit in terms of highlighting what we feel are the essential pieces uh, for you to know on this. Vanessa. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Vanessa Messiah. I'm definitely a rookie. Um, this is <laughs> this is my second year here at Simsbury. Um, so I'm so excited to be here in front of you all and to kind of share uh, not only the overarching goals that Mr. Petrina talked about, but really to focus on some of the initiatives underneath those goals and kind of specify what we're going to be doing this year. Um, so for the first, if you could flip, Georgia, thank you. One more time. Perfect. For our first goal, um, we're really focused on providing a challenging and supportive learning experience for our students. And we're focused on doing that in two ways. One is by finalizing our capstone requirements. And the second is supporting um, the transition to that new eight drop two schedule that Mr. Petrino was talking about. Uh, I know that Liz McKay had an opportunity, she is our capstone coordinator, our wonderful capstone coordinator, had an opportunity to speak to the board about the capstone goals and initiatives. And one of the things that I wanna highlight is that this is really about a multiple pathways approach for students. We want to provide them with flexibility, choice, opportunity. And so students have options. They can choose under three pathways which course they go for their capstone. Um, those three pathways are the course-driven pa capstone, there's the student-driven capstone, and there's also the experiential capstone. So very exciting. We currently have 55 juniors that are embarking on capstone this year. About 30 of those are gonna, 30 of those students will finish in the spring. And then another 25 will start semester two and they'll finish in fall of 2022. Um, of, of those 55 students, 30 are spread across a dozen capstone courses um, that, that are focused on that first path, pathway. Then we also have 20 that are going to be working on student design projects. And we have six students who are going the pathway of the experiential. Um, so our goal is really to build our in-house internships by continuing to build connections in the community so that we can increase the number of students choosing our experiential pathway and participating in that experiential learning. For our eight drop two schedule, as Mr. Petrina said earlier, um, there's definitely the yin and the yang. And we have gotten a lot of feedback from students, from parents that have really helped us to start to understand how we can best support our students. Um, the eight drop two schedule is a four day rotating schedule. It allows students to meet with six of their eight classes on a rotating period. Um, and the four day rotation allows for three of those classes to meet of the, on the four days. Um, classes are about 58 minutes long. 
And again, while there are some of the logistical bumps, um, such as scheduling meetings because your free period changes from day to day, the overwhelming consensus and feedback that we've received from teachers and students alike is that 58 minutes feels like the right amount of time for a class. Um, it really is benefiting teaching and learning. Um, and that rotation allows for students to have different classes at different parts of the day. So they're getting to experience classes um, and their energy levels at different times, which can really help and benefit them throughout all of the classes that they have. For our second goal, we are focused on ensuring success for every student. Um, and we are specifically focused on identifying students who struggle so that teachers can create the appropriate PGP or professional growth plans. Teachers can create academic growth plans. They can also create social emotional um, growth plans. And at the start of the year, we actually provided our teachers with data um, for students who struggled academically the year prior in order to help them formulate those goals. Um, and we also wanted to think about our distance learners. And so we held a, sp a side orientation for them to get them reoriented into being in the building and getting used to the school um, before they came back. We are also um, really focused on supporting our students socially and emotionally, as we know that they have gone through a very difficult last 1.5 years, as we all have. Um, and so we've reintroduced Connect this year, which I'm very excited about because I get to own it. Um, and and <laughs> Connect is meeting two times per month. Um, and our goal is to provide students with a safe and comfortable environment um, so that they can engage in that SEL work. In Connects right now, students are really focused on team building. In order to build that safety and to engage in the, in the SEL work, they need to feel safe and comfortable with each other. Um, and so they actually are gonna be meeting tomorrow for a Connect class and will engage in a team building activity where they get to know each other better, they get to know their teacher and advisor better. That learning is directly connected to our Trojan code um, because the learning that the students do in Connect is actually applied in our Trojan code and their day-to-day -day behaviors. And so we get to celebrate and recognize students for the, for the work that they're doing, for being good people, and for living the expectations of the code. For our third goal, um, we are worked, working on creating a safe and positive school environment. Um, so the first part of that initiative is focused on developing systems for meaningful teacher feedback. We are really appreciative of those first three half days um, because it allowed the administrators to have min, uh, meetings with each individual teacher. So we called them our five minute meetings. Um, some of them went over five minutes. Uh, but they were, it was an excellent opportunity to not only just see where teachers are at, but learn more about what supports they're going to need. Make sure that they feel connected uh, to the people in the building who have similar goals and initiatives. And it allowed us to know how we can best support our teachers. So for example, in one of my meetings uh, with the one of the department supervisors, she said, you know, it would really be helpful if every other week we could just have a 15 minute touch point so that you can help problem solve issues that I'm having on my team or just talk through any obstacles. And so we were able to schedule a 15 minute every other week meeting. And that's what we as the administrators really focused on. How can we support our teachers? How can we ensure that they feel like they know where to go when they have faced an obstacle or they need to give feedback, which we want because it helps us to make changes that really support our students. Um, on the student end, we're focused on re-engaging uh, our students and co-curricular activities. Um, so we have students already who are trying and wanting to create clubs with their advisors. Um, and last year, because of COVID, many of those meetings, most of those meetings happen virtually. And so the transition now is to have them in person, to have students with one another, um, obviously following our COVID guidelines, but having that experience to be in the same room with one another and be after school and engage in those co-curricular activities. And finally, um, our goal on prioritizing teamwork, we're focused on 
identifying and building staff support and teams, as well as increased administrators' uh, visibility. So during those five-minute meetings that I've that I referenced earlier, um, we were able to speak with teachers again about who in the building they could get support from, who in the building could be their go-to when obstacles come forward. And so we are going to continue to have those touch points with our teachers, with our department supervisors, so that we're really supporting our teams and building that team. We also, for our newer teachers, um, have reinvigorated the new Teacher Institute. They actually are going to meet this Thursday and have already began meeting. Um, so that they can learn more about their Simsbury High School community and build a team within their team. Um, and finally, administrators last year did not get to be in classrooms, in buildings as much as we wanted, to, as much as we wanted to be. Um, we attended class observations virtually for the most part. We pretended to be students in some of those situations. And now we have the opportunity to be in classrooms, be in hallways, be in shared spaces. And that is really going to allow teachers to have access and touch points with us and help with our communication. Um, that is it for me. So I'm gonna turn it back to Mr. Petrina. Thank you all for your time. Awesome. I, I've got great people working for me. Uh, I, hope you, I hope you heard that. Our last slide, Georgia. Um, for those of you that know me, I, I, I live by a mantra of passion and pride. Uh, I've been in this community a long time, and uh, I believe that students uh, need to find their passions. Uh, I believe teachers need to use their passions, and that's what kids connect to. And uh, we, the, the pride uh, of the school and pride in our building, and it's one of the reasons why we're one of the only schools in the state as far as trying even to have a dance. So um, that is all part of building this uh, system that, that, that really took a hit in every school. Uh, I'm on a regular uh, conference call with all the area principals. This is what we talk about. How do we reinvigorate? How do we do it? What obstacles are we overcoming? But building back school pride and building back that is, uh, is everything. But we added a little word in front of our passion uh, due to the times. Um, we needed it. Um, the students needed some compassion uh, in terms of making sure they felt safe here. And I will tell you, our staff desperately needed it uh, to feel safe to feel wanted, to feel heard. And uh, that's been our goal, uh, is to uh, think uh, in terms of compassion uh, and understanding those perspectives and understanding those changes. So this is our mission this year, uh, is, is to continue to roll with passion and pride, but with a little compassion added into that uh, as well. Thank you for listening. And uh, we're happy to take uh, whatever questions we like. I can try to repeat them, Janet. <laughs> um, my question is about the um, about the uh, you gave us the oh my god, no, I can't remember. Sitting from a microphone. Um, <laughs> and it's about um, our projects for the kids and getting them. When when is it a mandate for the um, capstone. capstone projects to be in place? And you gave us a lot of the students percentage of the who signed up. What when do we have? When do those kids have to like all be signed up? Yeah, so uh, it's a graduation requirement for the junior class and then on down. So um, again, 55, 56 students chose to do that this year. The other 300 will be doing it next year. Next year yeah, next year will be busy, exactly. So that's, it's actually serving us as a great uh, uh, run in terms of uh, getting a little soft entry uh, to it and building up our uh, 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 resources to, to make it work to the best. I actually think it's a wonderful idea. Uh, it's exciting to hear yeah. um, all this information about it. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I have two questions. Um, First is touch point on the school schedule. 
Now I do have children participating in your the lovely school schedule, and I was <laughs> curious of any amount of stuff. One, how the lunch getting better? You know, I know that that was a concern at the beginning. As well. I would love to answer about the lunch, but I'm going to turn it to Vanessa, and she's up there every day. I get to see it live in action every day. Um, so lunches, the first, I would say, day, were definitely backed up as our cafeteria staff kind of got used to the lines rolling through. Since then, they have improved tremendously. I would say for my first lunch, it's about five minutes that it takes for students to completely row through. The second and third, which are a little bit larger, takes about seven minutes. So students are still having 25 plus minutes to actually eat their lunch, socialize with their peers, and kind of get that downtime. So it's definitely improved from that first day, and that was because of feedback from students and parents. And the other one about the schedule, and I'll take a few too, is, is the homework. Um, is there a plan or will there be a plan to address it, it? And it could be because of COVID, everyone was on the block period. So those kids had four classes, right? And then they had one day off. Yep. And now they'll have, they have six classes an hour and they don't have a day off, you know? So it seems to me that some kids might be feeling a little bit of the social emotion gone because of that stress again. And so do teachers ever evaluate that and look together to say how much they're putting on? That's a great question, and uh, the answer is yes. So um, we have an organization called the School Culture Task Force, which has representatives from each department, and I task them at the beginning of the year that uh, you are going to be asked at the literally this time of year, I said, let's give it a month uh, and see where it lands. So we, uh, I don't want to say arbitrarily, we uh, had to give it our best shot as to what would be a fair amount of homework. So it's written in our policy of two and a half hours of homework, which seems like a lot. You do the math, you divide it by six, uh, that's where it stands. And um, uh, I, would, I would argue that um, our true schedule is eight, is three eights of the old schedule where you had to be prepared for eight classes. So uh, the six, we're hoping it works out. We're actually, Greg and I are meeting with some students. They He obviously listens to students every day. Uh, we're actually meeting with a group tomorrow uh, to start getting uh, uh, on the ground level boots feel for it so I can report back to our teacher group uh, to get their feel. So we are in the process of trying to make uh, homework is obviously a, a significant part of uh, uh, what's going on. So we, we will be evaluating it here in the, the next couple of weeks and making a uh, recommendation. And it could be, I will say that because of, and maybe the students feel that, but going from their presumed four, you know, no one really remembers two years ago. You know, right? No, I, I totally understand that. And uh, um, the, the, the four was really hard schedule. It was not, uh, uh, it, it, it was, it's difficult to cover the content in that, in that time period. Uh, I mean, just think about that. If you're, you're, you're going 80 something minutes, you're taking a 10 minute mask break or five minute break in the middle. And how much can you grind through? Uh, our teachers were having a hard time getting through it. And many kids, some, I, I'm not going to say all kids, many kids said, bring it on. I'll sit there for 80, whatever minute. This is great. I got four glasses, I got it. But there was a, a very large group of population that went, oh my God, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep doing this day in and out. So um, I think, again, uh, we've emphasized that the 60 felt right, uh, or the 58 minutes has felt right. Um, and I, I've checked in PE classes and science classes and math classes, and uh, that seems to be feeling uh, right. But a homework is a whole nother issue uh, that needs to be looked at. Thank you. And the, uh, the, are we able with the new schedule to still offer, or do we have any kids that participate in the like those staff programs or that kind of set field that some of the kids used to do? Do they do that anymore? So the Greater Hartford yeah. Academy of Arts. Yeah. 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 So we have the Greater Hartford Performing Arts Academy that we have students. The way it rotates, where the morning rotates and the afternoon rotates, the students can do the morning rotation of four classes and then they head to the academy and do the afternoon at the academy. And, and we have a counselor that specifically works with those students to fill in any gaps where they might have, be able to take an online class or do something at the academy that will cover for a credit that they need here. And then the last thing I'll say about teamwork, do we ever prioritize or can we add in time from like particularly Henry Jean's 
connection with like a map match or something to say, hey, are we to get to today, especially during this whole year where the map, I'm sure, took a hit? Um, how do we ever meet as a team with New York? Do you want to talk that? Sure. You can. you can do it there. Do you want to talk vertical, uh, map vertical? So, Jen, there's two ways we can do that. Um, actually, Steve Katrina and Scott Baker um, have allowed me once a month meetings to meet with department supervisors, 712, as well as uh, K-12 supervisors. So a big piece of that is having that alignment between the middle school and high school and having those leaders have the opportunity to have some very fruitful discussions and take some action. So that's one way. The second way is that in our major content areas, we have vertical teams. And those are K-12 related. So we have leaders on those teams specific to content. In this year, we are definitely adding back more teacher voice to really discuss the implications for our decisions in the classroom setting. So those are two very specific ways that we align vertically throughout the district. Greg, to you. Um, you mentioned the college planning partnership. How how are the kids who might need it accessing that? How do they know about it? So we promote that. Um, we meet with all of our junior parents. Um, our counselors meet with all the junior parents and the students in January, and that leads up to the March SAT. So we will talk with parents and, and students at that point. Um, we promote it through uh, uh, communications with, with families. Um, and it, in the past, they've actually come to the high school and run classes here at the high school. Last year, they did it online. Uh, and this year, they're going to do it online as well, which does actually create some flexibility for the kids um, to be able to go at different times based on their busy schedules. Um, so it's not like a live online class. It is a live online class, but they have multiple options. So if you miss one time, you can go at a different time. Okay. So that the flexibility actually was nice last year for the students. Um, they miss out on the face-to-face the -face in the classroom, which was also nice, yeah. but there was a little benefit for the online. So we will promote that. To, it's really focusing on the juniors as they lead up to taking that March SAT. Okay, great. And then Vanessa, for you about Canals. Because yes. um, when my kids were here, it was very different. So I'm just curious. We used to group the connects by special interests and things like that. How are we grouping the kids? Yep. And then um, how long is the connect period? So connects, uh, connects this year are 32 minutes long. Um, and again, they meet about twice a month. Um, the grouping is different. It is grouped by grade level and alphabetically. Um, and the, the plan is for those students to stay together for their four years. So again, we're really creating that safe and comfortable environment. Students know each other after the first year and can really dig deeper into some of the SEL work. Um, we're focusing for November and October, um, November and December to do, uh, meditation and mindfulness. And so we know before we get there, we have to create that, that safety. So again, that's why we're focused on teamwork. And then as students get to know each other, we can dig deeper into some of the, um, some of the, the harder work. Okay. So yeah. Is it like a, so you said it's twice as much as every other week? It's about every other week. Yep. There's some months, um, because of testing and things like that, where the, the schedule shifts a bit, but it's about t twice a month. Okay. Yep. Is it in one room? Say again. Is it in homeroom? Yeah, so there, it's in their connect classroom. It's like, yes, it's, yep, like it's like their, their advisory. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to ask our student reps to talk a little bit about their experience with the session. Sure. Just so we can get from that. Since they're on the press line. Absolutely. They are. Okay, right. so um, I just wrote down some notes. Um, overall, I think everyone's taking time to adjust to the new schedule, and I think it's great. Um, I think that, like, the main benefit of it from like, how I feel, what I've heard students and teachers say, um, it's a great class time, 60 minutes, instead of it being about 40 minutes like it was, or 80 minutes like it was last year. It's a really great class time to get a lot done. Um, I would say definitely a weakness is um, 
when students are feeling a little bit, what I've heard is students are feeling a little more stressed about homework just because instead of doing maybe homework that, like last year we have four classes of homework to do in a night, this year it's six classes, so I think maybe it's just a little bit more and just coming off of like online learning last year, it's a little bit kind of crazy right now and just trying to adjust, which is obviously normal. And I think teachers just about like, when, when is their, what are their free periods? When can they meet with students? Cause they can't offer like third period every day, that kind of thing. But um, overall, I think people are adjusting really well and it might take a little time, which is expected, but I already am kind of like getting the classes down or like what schedule is like, so yeah. Thank you. I agree with most of the things Olivia said. Uh, I mean, I agree that like yeah, 58 minutes is the time that works, but um, with the, I mean, with science classes with no lab, I mean, I'm taking environmental and physics. And so for both of those, it's every day, it's not a rotation, you know? Um, so there's no, you know, break period between and I feel like I, I've heard a couple of teachers say that it's not I mean it's not just the kids having trouble with that homework turnover it's when teachers um, you know maybe get behind in the class there's not much time to adapt to it because it's likely that they're going to have that class again right the next day so it's easy to get backed up I guess um, yeah so I think the biggest upside is the time period and the biggest downside would be uh, homework and turnover rate, you know. Cool. I, I appreciate that feedback. Uh, it's uh, it's timely and it's uh, accurate, and I and I would agree with you. Uh, we tried to give our teachers as much time as possible in those first few weeks to to get it. I mean, we talked about our five minute meetings, but other than that, those first three days were meeting PLCs and curricularly to try to get uh, organized in this. And it does take a different mindset. And I, I know kids are uh, struggling. You can imagine a thirty year teacher or a thirty year administrator uh, trying to figure out the new world. Uh, it, it has it, it takes an extra uh, layer, um, but uh, again, hopefully, in the long run, we'll see uh, uh, the benefits of it. But in the meantime, we'll certainly keep looking and seeing what we can do uh, to to tweak or make changes. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. I got another one. <laughs> I moved my purse out of the way so I don't kick anybody off. It was really great to see all the Does anyone need a stretch break? We all set. All right. So this is very exciting for me. In January, in my the midst of my 16th year here in Simsbury, the board supported a restructuring of the central office specific to the Office of Teaching and Learning, for which I have the privilege to be the assistant superintendent of. And in that restructuring, a couple of things happened. Right? We combined general education and special education under one umbrella, which is hugely powerful. I'm just going to grab my little clicker here. And we also placed four very powerful, focused, intentional, smart directors under that, un under that one umbrella of teaching and learning. And we're all here in person this evening to share some of the work that we'll be leading this year. So we have our Director of Elementary Curriculum and Assessment, Betsy Gonzalez, our Director of Pupil Services, Katie Crisula, our Director of Instructional Technology, Maggie Seidel, and our newest member of the team, our Director of Equity and Access, Dr. Tyresha Batchelor. So I'm gonna invite the four of them to come up here, just for the sake of transition. And as they do, just share with you the goals of this presentation. So they're twofold. One, Steve mentioned in his presentation how this strategic plan is making sense, right? So I spoke at the last Board of Ed meeting about the goals that we prioritized, our specific indicators that we prioritized, and how we got there. I'm going to touch and expand a little bit about that in just a moment. But this importance of coherence from the district goals 
to the Office of Teaching and Learning Goals and the work that we're leading at the school level and at the classroom level so that each and every day as educators in whatever role that we have, we are getting better with and for our students. The other goal is just to have you hear from these four amazing individuals and hear about the work that they're going to be leading aligned with our strategic plan. So this is a slide that should be familiar to you from the last time, and in it we encapsulate the three goals of student growth and success, a connected and caring school culture, and a premier workforce. And specifically, these are the indicators that we are going to be looking at very closely through our leadership work with, again, and for students. So I had shared some data with you last time. It was relative to uh, SBA, not SBAC, if everyone recalls, our Smarter Balanced Assessment. I gave you some information around our next generation science standards in those assessments, and also the SAT. And Mr. Stillman expounded a little bit on the SAT this evening. So this is a pretty informational slide relative to ESPA performance. So I want to orient the board at what we're looking at here. The bars, the blue bars, represent our students' math performance in meeting expectation or the performance standard on ESPA. What we also want to demonstrate here by the dotted line, that's the same, same proficiency standard, but for literacy. And those different bars represent different student groups. So the bar on the left, I know it's kind of hard for you to read without the screen in front of you, but is all students. The second bar is our white students. The third bar, Hispanic students. Our next bar, black students. Students with special education needs in male and female. So this slide tells a story of the data that we used to prioritize our strategic plan. So we shared that we know the same group of students has a disparity between their literacy performance, for example, and their math performance. You're going to hear about how we are going to approach that problem through our different lenses and to address it through a teaching and learning perspective. Okay, so this is data that grounds our work. It grounds the prioritization of this team. So what I would like to do now is share with you um, the very specific offices that are aligned in the Office of Teaching and Learning. So you're going to hear from each and every director and more specifically the work that they are leading throughout the course of this year. And then we'll take questions throughout or at the end if that's most appropriate. Okay, so first up is our Director of Elementary Curriculum and Assessment, Betsy Gonzalez. Thanks, Sue. So nice to be in front of everybody in person tonight. Um, so as Sue mentioned, one of our major priorities is working to close the gap that we have in math. What we do know is that over the last 18 months, our students have responded extremely well to our classroom-based instruction as measured by the formative assessments that our teachers give on an ongoing basis in the classroom. As Steve mentioned, March of 2020, all things changed, and we had to make some decisions around content, concepts, and skills that we would be able to deliver in this pandemic. And so we look to the National Math Priority Standards to guide our instructional decisions. Um, and what we decided that we wanted to focus on was depth over breadth and making sure that our students really secured the knowledge and skills that they would need to be prepared within their grade and as they advance to future grades. So we focused our work starting last spring and really thought about a plan to address some of the gaps that we anticipated and that are evidenced by the ESPA scores that Sue just shared. So working with the administrative team, we came up with a plan and those actions include making some thoughtful adjustments to the grade level scope and sequences to add back in lessons and skills and concepts that we had to shift a little bit during the 18 months, um, given the limited time that we had. 
we added a daily 15-minute supplemental math block in our K-6 classrooms to focus on building students' number sense, fact fluency, and a spiral review of previously taught concepts. So we're extending some math learning opportunities for students. And we also added some additional math tutor hours to support students who need that extra support and that intervention in mathematics. We have a very much have a standards aligned curriculum. And this year we're shining a spotlight on grade specific standards and the specific concepts that students will understand and the skills that they will apply as a result of their learning. And we call these learning targets and they're super helpful for teachers and give them great clarity in their planning, their instruction and their assessment of students. And this was something that we implemented starting in the spring of 2020 to give teachers tremendous focus on what is most essential. What is it that we want students to know and be able to do with confidence and with the data that we had to say that yes, they can do that and they have preparation towards those grade level skills so they will be successful going forward. And so that is gonna be some ongoing professional development this year as we work with teachers to really understand how to put those in practice to give them that clarity around their teaching. Um, as we have opportunities to revise or enhance some of our curriculum-based units, we're teaching into the competencies and attributes of the vision of the graduate. Um, we actually are starting with this document when we bring teachers to the table to work on curriculum revisions or development. We're starting with the VOG, looking at it for some inspiration uh, to help us inform some of the decisions we make around those particular units and ensuring that things are very much aligned to those um, competencies and attributes. We have a lot of the right structures in place to really foster classroom-based instruction and conversations around student learning. This year, we're enhancing those structures a little bit by bringing teachers together, bringing them to the table a bit more often to look at student work, to talk about what kids need, and some really doable tier one instructional strategies that the teachers can turnkey and put into practice in the classroom. So that just-in-time response to student learning. Um, so that is something that is gonna be underway in addition to our data teams and our student intervention teams. So it's just a more frequent opportunity to really think about where kids are, what do they need, and how can we respond? Sometimes it's about making those adjustments at the classroom level. Sometimes it's adding intervention if that's necessary for students. Speaking of intervention, we've adjusted our model a little bit this year because we know that some students need both reading and math. So we have a two-day, three-day schedule so that it comes out of the same instructional block, the same instructional time, so we're not pulling students too often from classroom because we don't want them to miss their core instruction. We are so incredibly excited to have our language arts consultants, our math coaches, our interventionists back in their roles this year. They have hit the ground running. They are super excited. We have some new folks to the team um, and they are being mentored as we speak starting over the summer by their fellow colleagues, their principals and myself uh, to make sure that they have the skills and knowledge and capacity to effectively support students and teachers. And we have a new team, a new teaching and learning team um, that I am so excited to get to know, to get to grow my expertise and knowledge and what I do. Um, but together we have incredible expertise and talents um, and just the thought of working together to really integrate our practices and learn from each other is super exciting. So looking forward to a great year and a great year with my new colleagues. Thanks, Betsy. Oh. <laughs> um, sorry. Anyways, up next is Katie Crisula, our director of uh, people services. Thank you, Beth. The details. <laughs> the details matter, I guess. Okay. So I, here in people services, what is our goal this year? So coming into this role and, and taking over for the work that Sue had led previously, we always picked a theme in our department, a theme that kind of um, from a PK to 22 cents brought us together. And this year in people services, we are rowing the boat through successful waters. What does that mean? In short, it is really around um, us recognizing the energy that we put towards our students into their individual needs, the direction that we provide and the work that we bring together with our families and our students to move them forward. So how are we doing that? Well, we are going to look at that student growth and success. 
And in part of that, we really want to focus on our IEP goals and objectives. We want to provide high leverage skills and make sure the targets that we are choosing are aligned with our standards and really going to be the right skills to close those achievement gaps. And that has to align as well with the instruction that we're providing. So the IEP is our guide, our instruction is how we're gonna get our kids there. And making sure that that remains in line with those content standards and our, and our curriculums. We also then um, wanna take a look at our vision of a graduate and how does that really be a guiding light of where we're taking our students in their IEP goals and objectives. I look at that vision of a graduate, and to me, that is what we see our students accomplishing through their IEPs. So that's also a key focus this year. Next is when we look at dyslexia as a specific learning disability. We want to ensure that we have continued consistency in our evaluation and programming for our students with dyslexia. Um, this is just something that we've worked on throughout the years and really want to ensure that we continue to visit and have some systems in place to grow our knowledge and um, support around dyslexia. As we move into the compassionate and connected school culture, this is again something that you're going to hear about. You've heard about it in the high school's presentation. You've heard about it in some of the elementary's presentations. And it's something that I know I'm working in um, collaboration with, with both Dr. Batchelor and Mrs. Gonzalez is around our SEL. And one of our guiding practices is that we continue to work with the CASEL competencies, the five CASEL competencies. CASEL is the Collaborative of Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. It's a national um, organization that is really in high regard around providing SEL instruction for students. So we just really want to make sure that we continue to develop a scope and sequence from K to 12. We've done that in the elementary school and it will continue to work through our secondary this year to ensure that we have that in place. We're also going to look at some skill building opportunities and screenings throughout um, our district. The second piece around that connected school culture is for our department to continue to support the work relative to those tiered interventions and our systems of support. So we need to ensure that we are bringing the right students into the special education referral process. This was referenced in our equity um, council recommendations, and it's something that as special educators, we feel very strongly that we want to make sure that we are asking questions about the right kids and um, providing students that just need a different kind of support, those opportunities through our tiered systems. And lastly, as we look at in, through this pupil services lens at our premier workforce, we want to provide our special educators, both certified and non-certified, experiences around two main areas. The first is IEP compliance training. This year, the state, as of July 1st, 2022, will be introducing a new IEP platform. So our documents are going to look different in about 10 months. And so there's a lot of training that needs to go into that, not only for our teachers, but also for our families, so working with SEPTO, and, also, and, and, and with our students, because again, this is the document that represents them. So each of our teachers, both um, all of our special ed teachers, but also our general education staff, some selected members of that, that general education staff, will participate in IEP compliance training to ensure that our IEPs continue to reflect the best practices of special education and really allowing the document to represent the student um, as best as it should. And lastly, some opportunities around behavioral support training for both certified and non-certified staff. We really want to provide additional training in regards to behavior support plans, behavior intervention plans, tiered levels of behavioral support, and positive behavioral approaches. And this is just continued growth in making sure that we are working with our students in the best way that they have success and can overcome any challenges. So again, how do we row the boat through successful waters? What is our work? It really is writing those goals and objectives and providing instruction aligned to our standards. It's making sure that we are supporting our tiered intervention systems and that we continue to provide training to our staff that really is going to support our students within special education to the best of our ability. So with that, I'm going to bounce to Dr. Tyresha Batchelor, who is our Director of Equity and Access. 
Thank you. Good evening. So my theme is I'm new, and <laughs> this is day 39 for me. Um, and so, well, actually, my theme is to hit the ground learning rather than running, because I don't want to trip over myself. Um, so I'm happy to be here and happy to be a part of the team. So my work um, encompasses all of the work of the team. And as part of the teaching and learning team, I'm looking at all of these entities through an equity lens. So I'm asking a lot of questions in terms of, these are great systems. Who is it working for? And where are there opportunities for growth and improvement? I use the vision of the graduate, standards, data, and the equity council recommendations as my springboard. So they're actually pinned on my bulletin board in my office. And if once I understand how to use Pinterest better, it will be there also. <laughs> um, because that's really what is driving my questioning, my thinking, and my planning. So the major thing that I'm doing this year is learning, and I'm working with the DEI network. Thank you, Ms. Tadon, for uh, mentioning that. I've actually attended two network meetings, so my learning is supporting the learning of the district. I'm providing professional development on implicit bias, and I'm really focusing on unfinished teaching and unfinished learning. There's great structures and great curriculum in place in the district, so we don't have to rewrite or recreate things. We just have to figure out the pieces that are working really well and find ways to replicate it and find ways to tweak it so that all students have access to the high quality education that is here in Simsbury. And that's what I'm here to do, making sure that those equity indicators of success are things that all teachers are thinking about. So before students fall into intervention, we're gonna make sure that there's a hard stop, there's a data discussion, there's parent involvement, and there's a full team approach so that that student is gonna have everything that they need. And when I say all hands on deck, it really is all three of us on deck. So I'm gonna give you an example. I'm working with school principals and teams and having data conversations. I've met with each of them individually. We've looked at data and I've met with their teams. Then I take that information back to the teaching and learning team and say, this is a problem of practice at one school. So we're looking at discipline data because we know that the more time students spend in the classroom, not and tiered intervention is when they're gonna have the best chance at meeting their goals and objectives. So I go back to the team and I share what we're working on at each school and then each team member has a piece of it. So I'm working with, I'm partnering with the director of elementary curriculum and instruction, looking at opportunities to further engage all students. So what does that look like? To be very simple, that looks like math strategies. So what strategies are working for the boys? What, what is working for certain populations of students? And how can we provide professional development so that we're sharing the data and we're sharing the knowledge and the skill set? Then I'm working with the Director of Pupil Services looking at the referral process. She mentioned the referral process to special ed, but we know that some great strategies for L students or students with learning disabilities are some strategies that all students can benefit from. So when I look at equity and access, I'm asking questions in terms of what are you doing for students who have these specific math behaviors? What are we doing for these gaps? How can we support all teachers so that they have access to all of the things that the tools that students need. And that's where Maggie Seidel comes in, the Director of Instructional Technology. So she's my go-to person. So she's gonna to talk to you more about the low and high technology. I'm learning that, but that is a tool that can support students, not just students who are behind, but also students who are above grade level so that they can continue to have enrichment opportunities. So, in looking at equity, it is all kids being provided with every opportunity to meet, to reach, and to go beyond all our expectations. So we have to continue to work together to do that. So I'm thankful for the opportunity to do that, and I'm going to continue learning tomorrow on day 40. <laughs> and I'm gonna turn it over to Maggie Seidel, who is the Director of Instructional Technology. 
Perfect. Good evening, everyone. Thank you um, for hosting us tonight. So I wanted to share with you a bit about the priorities of the technology department. And to start, I wanted to frame what our vision is in the department. And that's really to utilize both high and low tech. And so we do mean a good old pencil sometimes and a good old post-it note, um, along with some of our higher tech opportunities through Chromebooks and iPads and other means, as a way for improving accessibility to the curriculum and resulting in that equitable learning experience for all students. So really you're gonna hear my ability through my department work of the key to many of the other um, people that have already spoken here today. So in terms of the student growth and success, we have three priorities in the technology department. And the first one is to provide and maintain one-to-one -one devices and software for all of our students and our staff. As you can imagine, um, that's a very large undertaking, but we have successfully gotten all of our students K to 12, their devices, and we're working tirelessly to make sure that our classroom technology, along with the 50 plus software applications that we have, are ready to go and are being utilized by our teachers and our students. Our second goal is to utilize those tech tools to access the math standards. We know that the tools in the technology department, both low and high tech, can mean some opening doors for students. Not only, um, you know, there could be a, a particular platform that we use, but also it's engaging many times for our kids to utilize technology to really unpack those standards. The third thing in the student growth and success, um, our priority is to embed the vision of the graduate within the Trojan Tech Team capstone experience. As you've heard today, um, the capstone experience at the high school is a very, very exciting opportunity. We do have a Trojan Tech Team, which are students that are able to utilize their gifts and talents and their interests in technology to support both fellow students and also teachers. Um, so I actually brought today our Trojan Tech Team um, in-house internship request. Um, and this is where kids can choose to utilize their Trojan Tech team as their capstone experience. And we have three students who have already chosen that, so we're very excited. Um, and this is an opportunity for them to demonstrate that curiosity that they've already got that interest. It's self-directed. There's communication. They're thinking about ethical and professional opportunities when they're using technology. So it truly is the vision of the graduate exemplified in this capstone experience. Um, so we're very excited excited about that. In the second area of focus in compassionate and connected school culture, um, two priorities this year, to utilize technology to accommodate and to minimize learning gaps. The department, the technology department is at the table for our student intervention teams, for our special education students, for our SRIP students, but also for our students who need enrichment. We want to utilize that tool, that key. I always use that, that analogy of that key to open doors, and we've already had this amazing opportunity to sit and to work with colleagues and with other teachers to help them to think through what might be the key to unlock a curriculum opening for a student that may be struggling. And the second area is to revise the website to engage staff and also to welcome families. We know that the website is one of the first places that people go when they're either new to our district or when they're trying to find a resource. So we're looking about that feasibility and that user end on the website and how we can better provide tools. Um, the third area in Premier Workforce, we're really working obviously as a team to collaborate, to work smarter, um, and to really utilize our gifts and talents. So that's a collaborative effort in this workforce. I'm working to relaunch the ITT team, which is the instructional technology team. That's members, teachers from each of the seven buildings that come together to discuss instructional technology, how to benefit their content area, their grade level, um, and just maybe some new things that are out there that we can enhanced teaching and learning. And the third priority in the Premier Workforce is the realignment of our technicians and our technology team. Um, we've taken some time this summer to, first of all, do some hiring, to do some reshaping of roles and responsibilities, and within that to create some systems and structures to really um, effectively use what we've got and also to make sure that we've got the ability to continue our practices moving forward in a very efficient way. So. The work this year is really about building the capacity of our premier workforce between our library media specialists, our technology team, um, our technicians themselves to ensure that we've got these opportunities that have been outlined in the other two buckets in terms of providing opening access and an equitable learning experience for all of our students. Thank you. 
So this team does not disappoint. Um, it's hard to believe we've been together for 39 days as a group, but what I hope each one of you heard were the themes of engagement, the theme of expectation, the theme of equity, and most important, the theme of excellence for every kid every single day here in Simsbury, and how this Office of Teaching and Learning is going to lead that work and support that work from the district level to the student level in the classrooms. So at this point, we are happy to answer any questions that board members may have. Long time listener. <laughs> 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 Katie, this may be for you and Dr. Brash, you, you hit it on it too. I was just curious if you could maybe take a little bit deeper dive about the referral issues, right? We know there's over representation uh, among certain groups. I just, what, what's, I guess my question is really, um, what's the examination look like? How, you know, how's that going? That, that kind of stuff. Katie, you want to? Yeah, so I think I can answer that in regards to what are we doing to ensure that moving forward our referral process is what I would call tight. And that is to work with our tiered interventions, to work collaboratively, to ensure that we are offering appropriate interventions to all of our students in all areas. So not just academic, but also behaviorally. We're also gonna take a look at the data around the length of time students are in those referrals, or in those interventions. Because again, we don't want to rush to referral if we have other ways of answering our questions. So oftentimes in special education, it's about what do we not know about a kid that leads us to referral. And if we are able to answer that through our student intervention team, Team, we need to ensure that we are utilizing the process, utilizing the system's approach to those interventions and, and ensuring that we get to those kids in different ways and it doesn't have to be special education. So it's not necessarily a special ed thing around our referral process as much as it is our equity and access and our um, our. our curriculum and assessment. So it's working together collaboratively, utilizing the expertise of the special ed department and our school psychologists to also inform that process, um, to have those very collaborative conversations that include our parents, that we're answering their questions as well. Um, and that really should help us ensure that we're, again, we're referring the right kids, not based on the you know, a reaction to behavior or anything like that. We're utilizing our systems and our, our interventions to support kids where they're at. Okay, I don't know if you had anything to add. Sure. Yeah, I was gonna say, you guys do have limelight, so you can actually- Oh, they're all on, okay. I feel tall. <laughs> I feel tall. Everyone's sitting down, so I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, so I, I thank you. I also wanted to mention that when I started, I took a close look at the Equity Council's recommendations. And those recommendations were really solid. And that was really, like I said, the springboard to my entry plan um, and to what questions I was going to have. And one thing that I heard loud and clear was that we needed to take a look at the disproportionate disproportionate disproportionality, sorry, between our student discipline referrals. And so before they even get to the process of we're talking about our, our process for referrals, our process to special ed, we need to just look at what's happening with students in the classroom. Um, and, and so one thing that was mentioned was an asset base um, and instead of a deficit base. And so I took that and I took that to understand that you don't, we don't just need to look at professional development for implicit bias. We also need to look at cultural competence. We also need to look at um, teachers' pedagogy. We also need to make sure that our students are seeing themselves in the work and feeling valued and feeling a sense of belonging because those are all the things that would help students to be able to engage and to form relationships. So some of the professional development that I've already done was on building relationships and how to create win-win um, scenarios for students. Um, and the next step is going to be to look at our curriculum and to make sure that our students see themselves in it. So again, it's looking at all hands on deck coming from different perspectives and also at different points of time.
Dr. Batchelor, I really appreciate you um, bringing that back forward. That was going to answer the question about teach back opportunities because we did, through Equity Council, provide, you know, kind of a roadmap. And one of the things that we were concerned about was some of those nuances. And then wanting, wanting to make sure that, you know, that the teachers or administration has an opportunity to learn, right? Because every child is different, every situation is different, but are they all looking at the situations the same? And is that what's driving some of the numbers, right? And, you know, and, and so hoping that even through the exercise that you're going through, that that provides even some lessons to learn, you know? That they can go back and look at some of the data and say, okay, this is, we can grow from this and we can do it differently. So thank you for referencing the work that the council did. Thank you for doing the work. <laughs> <laughs> I just have more like nuts and bolts questions. Um, so Betsy, when you mentioned the 15 minute math block and an additional tutor, out, tutor hours, mm -hmm. are kids being pulled from class instruction for those tutor hours? Yeah, so the principals work on a very flexible schedule, so they have time built in uh -huh. um, where students are being pulled, and we work really hard to for students not to miss core essential instruction. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And then my other question was, Maggie, mm -hmm. we had a lot of kids who needed help with connectivity. Are we still providing that for kids that need it? Yes, okay. we are. We do still have the mobile hotspots for students that have needed it, and um, we'll continue to provide those. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, certainly we'll be providing you updates. That was a mouthful. Um, I think I took him some math there. Um, we'll be providing you updates on our work as the school year continues. And again, just thank you for your support in this restructure. Thank you all very much for all your hard work. Yeah. Thanks for coming back to day four. <laughs> we hope you're here on day 181. appreciated how the high school and teaching and learning all tied into vision of the graduate and the strategic plan because you can truly see how that's driving the work and um, and it's really nice to see that that's referenced and being used as a guideline okay with that we are on to um, board of ed committee assignments so uh, I sent that around to everybody in advance, um, and I did ask that the chairs reach out to their committee members to work on timing and organization of meeting schedules. Um, I did not hear back from anybody other than Lydia, who has agreed to be our sustainability um, liaison. Thank you, Lydia. Um, and uh, with that, we are on to our second public audience. And everybody laughed. Pardon? Okay. So no public audience. And um, next meeting is Tuesday, October 12th at the Board of Ed Conference Room. And with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. All second. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. All right.